first issue that I would like to, to raise is the issue uh, of uh, uh, what uh, was uh, a term mainstreaming versus excep exceptionalistic uh, programs for uh, people with mental disabilities. And again, stress the fact that the Israeli law that we are uh, now celebrating 10 years for its inception uh, is uh, obviously an exceptionalistic law uh, aimed intentionally to uh, create some kind of a corrective discrimination for uh, people with mental disabilities who have been negatively discriminated for many years. So in a way, uh, it, it uh, takes away uh, these people from the mainstream of, of uh, let's say, of medicine and, uh, unfortunately, from social services. Now, uh, I, would like, I think that we have to... Uh, the, the, uh, what we call uh, the reform that is about or may happen soon, uh, that we talk so much about, uh, the reform which uh, is aimed at transforming the responsibility for in and outpatient psychiatric services from the government to the uh, health, general health providers to the Kupot Cholim. Uh, what it would happen if it uh, is accepted is that again there will be some uh, problem or a large problem of coordination between the government or between the rehabilitation system and the medical system, which now will include the out and inpatient uh, psychiatric service. So in, in a way, uh, we are eliminating one coordination problem, that the problem of uh, incoordination between psychiatric services or psychiatric uh, care and uh, uh, physical care, and creating another uh, gap, another uh, need for, for coordination between rehabilitation and, and, let's say, therapy or treatment. So the whole issue about treatment versus uh, rehabilitation will raise again organizationally in a different way. And I think we should really both uh, ask uh, uh, our guests and, and th give ourselves give, give a lot of of thinking to this issue. The second issue that I would like to, to raise, uh, I think that uh, while uh, Dr. Hogan spoke mostly about the organization of service, uh, of services, I, th I thought that uh, Dr. Professor Solnikroft really centered a lot more about the process itself and what happens during the process and uh, stages of the process uh, for example, the whole issue of uh, how uh, professionals who come from different professions uh, may work with each other. One of the things, by the way, that occupies my thinking for a lot of time, and, and I think that uh, when I look at the, the people who are now in this room, I see too few psychiatrists, <laughs> much more fewer than I would like to see. And I must say regretfully that uh, my profession uh, takes uh, too little interest in rehabilitation. I think that most of the people who are around here uh, are social workers. Maybe that's my fantasy. Quite a number of psychologists and people who come from other professions, but too few uh, people from nursing staff and too few from psychiatry. And I think that we should uh, give a lot of thought and even uh, consult. <laughs> well, I, d I, d I didn't count, and, and for many of them, I don't know exactly which professions you come from, but that's my hunch. It's not a result of a research. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think that the, the whole issue about uh, how uh, professionals who come from different professions uh, have to uh, cooperate or um, uh, may participate in a process, I think we should 
uh, give much thought to it, both uh, among ourselves and I think that we would like to, to, hear from, to hear more from our guests about uh, these issues. Um, so I think that uh, the, the first part I'll ask uh, people from the audience uh, to raise issues and then probably we'll do it uh, twice or three times after a few questions just uh, uh, involve the members of the panel and then go for another round of, of questions. Oh, Rami Rudnik, psychiatrist, philosopher from Canada. Um, I have um, two questions. One is about the importance of peer support workers or peer providers from across the ocean, both from England and from the US, and lessons that can be learned with challenges and opportunities in relation to peer providers for Israel. And the um, second question, again across the two countries, is about service delivery models, particularly intense ones like ACT, assertive community treatment, knowing that the UK, at least initially, I might be wrong, but that was what I was told, um, was initially somewhat resistant. Um, and I've heard even recently that there's still some resistance with the argument that might have a lot of merit to it, that ACT is quite contextualized to, say, the US, and therefore, if there are alternative services, then maybe it's not as needed as may be evidenced by part of what you were showing us, Graham, about the fact that it doesn't necessarily reduce your admissions, but recognizing that Israel also had, it's not a s secret, it's public knowledge, had some resistance to ACT implementation also. What could be the lessons learned across two countries uh, for Israel regarding those uh, service delivery models? You know, it seems to me that uh, a lot c could be learned not only from how to do things, but uh, how not to do things. And some of the issues that have been raised here, you know, touch on that. My name is Raoul Strauss, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, perhaps it's a little open-ended question, but I'd just like to know, as someone with a head in research, or someone who's interested in research, where the panel thinks the cutting e edges of research are in the areas of rehabilitation. And I'm not just talking about necessarily evaluation of various outcome, uh, outcome models or new innovations in, uh, in rehabilitation models, but where, where, where do the panel think the cutting edges in research are in order to encourage younger uh, residents in the field and even, uh, even more, uh, I would say, accomplished researchers in the field to get involved in, uh, in research in the areas of, of, of rehabilitation? since it's often been perceived as not being a very sexy area to get involved in, uh, where the more biological approaches to psychiatry are more attractive to some of the younger people getting involved in research. Where the, where the panel thinks uh, uh, research can be pitched, that can attract you know, some of the younger and brighter minds in the field. I'm not a psychiatrist. My name is Uri Aviram. Uh, I think the idea of recovery as some people explain that, and there are many points of view. I, I define the, the term recovery, a, a term for all seasons, as, as, as it might be. Uh, it is a very humanistic, very uh, uh, desirable uh, concept. But in fact, the system that provides us money in order to operate a system is the general system, and they as I understand, taxpayers don't like to give money just for people to feel good or to feel to, for people to achieve their goals. They would like to see results. They would like to see how many people were doing better, how much money we saved society, how much less we have to pay for taxes. How do we deal with this issue of legitimacy? of society with the ideology of, that we have of recovery. Well, thank you, Uri. I, I'm glad that you just defined yourself as what you are not. 
Un uh, until you come to the mic, I would like to add another question. I, I think we didn't hear anything in this presentation up to now about the role of non-governmental or non-profit organizations uh, in the system. And I would like to ask you to comment on that. My name is Benny Pfefferman, and I'm, I am from the labor, from the industry trade and labor market, in labor, in, uh, labor ministry. I, I'm, I don't know if, uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment now, but I want to raise uh, two questions. Uh, of course, there are questions that belong to integrating disabilities in the labor market. The first one, regarding operating all services under one roof, if I understood you correctly, you bring up the needs to coordinate services received by persons with mental disabilities and giving those service under one roof. The question is, how do you see operating the employment, the employment issue as one of, as one, as a one-stop center, giving you concept that all services should be dealt with a one-stop shop? It's the first one. The second question is, the approach outlined in the papers for a, an overall solution for person with mental disability is, in is interesting. But begs the question, to what extent does this approach contradict the other approach? We state that we wish to integrate all persons with disability of all types without segregation one type of disability. If if it is your belief that people with mental disabilities need unique treatment by nature or their disability, how do you address the matter of stigma which is likely to increase the negativity which exists in the minds of potential employers and causing them not to employ people with mental disability? Thank you. Max Lachman, <coughs> some of you have pointed that in the beginning of the change, uh, there was contact with the political level. Uh, a commission or a meeting with the minister, uh, we also, uh, we, we, we say that, with, uh, uh, that the, the law was by uh, the Knesset, and uh, all, all the time we have contact with the political level, something push the change. So I want to, to ask about if there is, what, what is your experience of uh, uh, working with the political level? And secondly, what is the role of the, uh, of the uh, service user, so advocacy about it? It is uh, something who can influence uh, to put more political uh, level into the process, or it's something where no, no influence at all? I, I want to make uh, two comments and ask two questions. The first comment is uh, to Dr. Hogan, in your, one of your first slides, you showed a slide in which you said, which would be familiar to us, because just like Uri Aviram showed earlier, the more money, the money to the community was going up and the money to the hospitals were going down. However, I just want to correct that, that if I understand your slide correctly, it's unfortunately and surprisingly not the case over here. So the issue of follow the money doesn't necessarily uh, apply here. And I think we have to, uh, because this is also an interactive uh, workshop, I think it's an opportunity for us to reflect upon that issue. And that although we have here in Israel developed psychiatric rehabilitation services over the last decade and more, we have not actually closed a single hospital while that was happening, and that's something I think important. Second comment I wanted to make was about, uh, you quoted also uh, Ms. Carter and her comments about you know, the most important thing is that we know now people can get better, and I think you added a, a profoundly important uh, comment about that we can predict that, and I think that's something that we should carry along with us in terms of, our, uh, of being humble of what yet may happen. Uh, my two questions are, the first, is uh, uh, Professor Thorn, uh, Thornigroft, you described uh, the basically creating new teams and new roles that uh, different people from different professional backgrounds filled 
And towards the end in the discussion, it was also mentioned the importance of trying to help the person maybe avoid a, uh, a, an identity of a, of, a, of a patient and follow that trajectory. And I was wondering about the implications for that in terms of training. And that also ties into Dr. Hogan's comments, uh, uh, introducing the concept of a recovery specialist. So if there's, I would be curious about thoughts about these new roles in the mental health system and what kind of education and training you think are necessary for these new roles. And finally, just maybe a more technical question uh, to Professor Thornycroft is about the issue of the teams in the catchment areas. I was wondering whether a person within a catchment area has the possibility to choose a, among a number of different teams to be treat, to, to receive, see, receive services from or not. Ron Shaw from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a social worker. And my first question is, Israel is a multicultural society and primarily an immigrant uh, society. And what is your uh, message or experience um, in terms of working with different cultures and applying the principles of practice of uh, psychiatric rehabilitation to an immigrant society? Um, I was speaking about universal principles, a universal way of applying the recovery orientation, or uh, maybe beyond engagement with different cultures, there are different principles of practice which could be applied to the work with different cultures, uh, both on the individual level and on the organizational level. And my other question is, we are speaking a lot about the identity of um, a um, person with mental disabilities. What about the identity of the professionals? Um, we spoke about um, mu um, multicultural teams, David, you mentioned it as well, um, but where the unique knowledge of each profession come into action when we are speaking about multidisciplinary teams? I mean, I'm not clear what is the role of the psychiatrist, the social worker, the occupational therapist, what is their unique knowledge and role within the multidisciplinary team? And I think that we should address it as well. Okay. Well, I, I suggest that we we'll ask no questions at the moment, but let uh, members of the panel to respond to the questions we heard up to now. Just to mention, say something about your last uh, question, Ron. I would say that I think that, that one of the difficulties in my own mind for my fellow psychiatrists that in such teams, not necessarily they would be the head of the team. And I think this is one of the main difficulties of psychiatrists who are really uh, used to be on top, to be the directors. Tomorrow, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, current research on psychiatric rehabilitation models. And so I'll, I plan to talk quite a bit about ACT and supported employment and some of the questions that have been raised and about the cutting edge of where we are in research on those models. So I'm not going to say anything about uh, that now, but I, I hope to uh, say quite a bit tomorrow. Um, in the you know, in the U.S., uh, even though we uh, are a totally profligate uh, country in terms of finances and mental health, uh, Dr. Hogan uh, pointed out that 17% of the U.S. Uh, GDP goes to the health uh, care services, and we may waste money in uh, every aspect of health care that uh, you look at. Nevertheless, um, since mental, people with mental uh, illness don't fight back and don't have unions and don't have uh, lobbyists and all. We are constantly picked on and, uh, and asked to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of what we do uh, in mental health care. And so we have done a few longitudinal uh, studies of costs and we're under tremendous uh, pressure from the government to do more. And, uh, one thing we know sure, for sure from those studies is that um, the one aspect of what we do in psychiatric rehabilitation that really dramatically reduces costs is helping people to get a mainstream job. So if you follow people uh, for 10 years who have become 
steady workers and by and the way we define that is that they work at least half of the time and that should in that in our studies is somewhere between 25 and 30 if 30 percent of the people in a mental health center if you're doing a reasonable job with employment center uh, services 25 or 30 will become steady workers in mainstream competitive jobs and if you follow those people over 10 years um, they uh, their health care utilization starts going down after the second year, goes down dramatically for about five years, and then uh, stays stable at almost no utilization. So, and I've, I follow lots of uh, people who are in this category that I've uh, been their doctor for 20 years, and uh, I see them once a year for a med check. That, that's the amount of mental health care they get. They have totally moved out of the mental health system. Their identity is a worker. They live independently. They take care of themselves. And the average reduction in costs in U.S. dollars compared to similar people in the same studies with the same diagnoses who don't go to work, the average reduction in mental health costs alone is about $160,000 per uh, patient. $160,000 per patient. Hmm? No, over 10 years, over 10 years, 160,000. So if you, if, you know, if you get 100 people to work, that starts to be uh, meaningful money. We don't see those kinds of reductions for helping people to be stably housed. We don't see those kinds of reductions helping people to stop abusing substances. We don't see those kind of reductions helping them to control the uh, symptoms of their illness. So it really is a psychiatric rehabilitation and intervention uh, much, much more than anything that's uh, related to treatment that I've ever seen that helps people to get out of the mental health system and to um, reduce the cost of service. And of course, that doesn't, in, that doesn't even include the costs that, uh, you know, they start to have an income and they start to pay taxes and they're not uh, drawing down, uh, uh, you know, Medicaid uh, payments uh, from the federal government. That's just health care costs. So the, the you know the cost the cost reduction or the of helping people get back to work is is uh, just extremely dramatic. I'll pass this on rather than dominating. Okay, thanks. Well, I've got twelve questions noted. I'll just pick up one, which is um, having an effect when you can talk to politicians so they might listen. And the example I'll give is a man called Richard Layard who is uh, a health economist in England. He works at London School of Economics. And he became very famous about five years ago because he wrote a book about happiness. And suddenly he was all over the television, newspapers, everybody wanted to know, you know, what is the secret of happiness? And he sort of had a nice manner and was very gentle, so he was very popular. And then uh, he was also made a lord by the Labour government, so he then talked about happiness in the House of Lords. <laughs> And then he went on to think a bit more, and he thought, what would be the most important single thing to do in a society to increase the stock of happiness? And he thought, he read, he discussed it with people, and he said, the most single important thing is to properly treat depression, or people with depression. And then he said, well, what should we do if we were serious about treating people with depression uh, much better and to, to a greater extent? And he, um, he summarized the evidence, he said, is to offer a, a huge expansion in the number of psychological therapists in the whole country. Now, because he was already in, in our government and in the governing party, he then had access to finance ministry, health ministry, and so on. And he also built up a consortium of people from academic, from the health service, of politicians. And he then wrote a short report called the Depression Report, about 10 pages, very simple language. Um, he translated sort of academic speak into sort of ordinary, almost journalistic speak. And it had very, very high penetration into the political sort of system. And he went to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and said, I think what we need is 3,000 new psychological therapists above and beyond what we've got. And I would like you to invest 165 million pounds. Because if you do, then the savings will be even greater than that through lack of payment for social security benefits and through the tax that those people will earn and pay into your exchequer by working. And he had, as a health economist, he could make that case very persuasively and um, to our amazement, the government said yes. 
So now we have a new thing, which is called improving access to psychological treatments. It's being developed all over the country again because of the economic case, and that came up again this morning. And I, for, for me, that's a very important lesson. And in fact, I had a chance to talk with Tamar over lunch. And she, again, she stressed very, very much the importance of talking to the finance ministry and speaking in economic terms. So even though you have a sort of humanitarian or a therapeutic case, you translate it into money terms, then you bid for money on the basis of the, the benefit. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Mike Slade. I don't think I've uh, said hello, so shalom. Um, I'm going to be more ambitious than Graham in trying to tackle six questions, but each one will be much thinner as an answer, which um, hopefully will make as much more, more sense tomorrow after I've said things in a slightly more detailed way. Um, the, just firstly, following on the money question, absolutely, every system must demonstrate value for money or it will not survive. The question is, what's the value? The money is reasonably, reasonably easy to measure. What's the value? In other words, what are we really trying to achieve? And my suggestion would be the things that we should hang our hats on, which is a very colloquial term meaning the things we should make the case really matter, are two things. Firstly, the extent to which people who use our services are attaining valued social roles, such as having a partner, having a job, having um, neighbours that we know and trust, having uh, social life and, and so forth. And secondly, the attainment of personally valued goals, which are idiosyncratic and will differ from person to person, but are highly important if people are to find a life worth living. Um, the second question about research, my, my suggestion about um, cutting edge research is twofold. Firstly, um, a, a high quality research focus on personalization, moving beyond the so-called nomothetic or group level data provided by um, research designs such as randomized control trials to understanding individual markers or predictors of, of responsiveness. And the, the real challenge is moving to incorporate not only in biological markers, such as the amazing work going on in genomics and protogenomics at the moment, but also psychological and social markers. So for example, are there interventions that don't work if someone is too poor? Poverty is a big predictor of mental ill health and it may well be something that impedes the effectiveness of intervention. So there may be social and psychological markers as well. And secondly, we need good quality, really robustly designed intervention studies that move beyond observation and, and service evaluation to um, identify new ways of supporting people in their lives. And those interventions will increasingly have to take place not at the individual level, in a way that can easily be framed as treatments, but rather at the community and social level for example, interventions that build cultural resilience, the ability to maintain a cultural identity over time and in the face of identity threats. Um, the third strand about um, immigrant populations, uh, Graham um, alluded to earlier to the um, experience we have in England with um, a large um, number of people from black and minority ethnic communities coming in. And we've been undertaking research in relation to what recovery means for that group. And we've learned two things. Firstly, it means very much similar to what it means for majority populations. A life worth living doesn't greatly differ. And secondly, we've learned that there are some differences in emphasis. So for example, people from BME communities tend to have an identity that is more collectivist and less individual than people from the majority population in England. They also tend to express spirituality in different um, terms than uh, the majority population who tend to use religious language. The, the fourth trend I want to briefly to pick up is stigma. Um, we should think very carefully about the messages we send about our basic understanding of mental health and mental illness. Um, because we should know, for example, research that suggests that more biological understandings of mental illness are associated with increased stigma, stigmatizing beliefs held in the community in relation to issues such as predictability and um, likelihood of, of risk. The, the fifth question I, I'd like to address is about peer support workers and peer professionals. So just to define those terms, a peer professional is someone in a professional role, such as a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a nurse, a social worker, and so forth, who also, in the course of that role, discloses they have a lived experience of mental illness, either a personal experience of an illness or experience as a family member or friend. 
And peer professionals are a real challenge because we know that, assuming that the mental health profession is pretty similar to other, other, other populations, there's going to be a high number of people in the mental health system who have that experience. Very few people disclose that, and that raises hard questions about why that is. The second aspect to the question, peer support workers, these are people employed, just as Graham was mentioning earlier about user researchers, where people are employed because they have those two types of experience. This is people employed because they have lived experience of mental illness to work in the system. And there are exciting changes afoot internationally in that regard. Tomorrow I will talk about an initiative in England where we are piloting approaches to moving towards a workforce which comprises at least 50 5-0% of people with lived experience in the mental health system. And finally, the question about mainstreaming versus exceptionalism. I'd, I'd like to illustrate that with a client, a, a service user I see for therapy, who, who tells me his goals in life are he wants a job, a relationship, somewhere to live, to have a holiday, and for the voices to stop beating him up. I think he perfectly illustrates the kind of balance that we need. We need some specialist services, but mostly we need services located in and supporting access to mainstream opportunities. And that may mean that our role identity needs to change as mental health workers, away from feeling our job is to fix and treat people in a clinic, and instead grappling with some of those social issues that exclude people from mainstream services. These guys are good. <laughs> See, what's, uh, what's left to say uh, uh, something about? Um, let me uh, think a little bit about the challenges associated with uh, recovery, the uh, dilemma of wanting to be optimistic uh, and knowing that it's possible for any person to get better, but at the same time that some won't. So what, what about that? Um, the, I'll end up saying that the, it's empirically important, as well as common sense, as well as humanistic, to expect the best all the time, but to be prepared for the best not to happen all the time. Both of those things are uh, important. So why is it empirically as well as humanistically important to approach things uh, that way? In all human relationships, positive expectations have a tremendous impact on outcomes. We know this in multiple fields of endeavor. We know, for example, the Westinghouse studies of industrial engineering, where it turned out that just changing the lights improved productivity in industrial environments. And the interpretation was that uh, workers felt that because the lights were being changed, somebody was being paying attention to them, and so they were more uh, productive. Or in education, the so-called Pygmalion in the classroom studies, where uh, uh, teachers were told, you probably couldn't do this research ethically these days, but teachers were told about groups of essentially identical children, uh, average children, that uh, one group was in fact intellectually superior and one group looked average but they had learning problems. And at the end of the year, these groups of uh, average children, the one with the expectation of better performance in fact had higher academic achievement and the, the one with the suspicion of learning problems had lower academic achievement. And then if we come closer to home and look at all the research on psychotherapy, we see that across all of that uh, research, the most important factor in clinical outcome from psychotherapy is the relationship. It's not the clinical skills in applying a modality. That comes in about 50% less than the value that's attributed to the, um, to the relationship. And then finally, to come back to healthcare or medicine overall, one of the reasons why we do randomized controlled trials is it turns out across all areas of medicine, placebo has about a 30, 35% impact on outcomes. We should use it all the time, <laughs> right? So the- Also have side effects. Yeah, 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 it can have side effects. Usually not, maybe not so bad. So the, um, the it's, so my, my proposition is it's empirically and humanistically necessary to communicate high expectations all the time. But clinically, we know we also have to prepare not for the worst, but we have to prepare for bad outcomes, which is why the 24-hour crisis service uh, in Graham's uh, approach is, uh, is so uh, critical. 
And I'll comment on one other issue. I'll see if I can make this crisp, but it's this tension between uh, specialization and, uh, uh, and, and generalization. Um, so to apply this, first of all, in the context of, of ACT, it's interesting how the ACT intervention has become a thing in and of itself. Um, but I can remember the visiting many, many years ago the Mental Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, which was the home of the second ACT team. The first, of course, was the hospital team that moved out from the hospital with their, with their clients that led to many of the practices. Let's do things in the community that we did in the hospital. Let's, avail let's be available every day. Let's have a, a, a team meeting every day to look how people are, uh, uh, are doing. But when they developed this program in the Madison community, there was one mental health center serving the entire community. And they essentially had four services. Um, all, the, all the work they did was with pre people with serious mental illness. One of those services was essentially an outpatient clinic. And the rationale was if people are somewhat stable, if they can somewhat monitor how they're doing, if they're willing to come to us, why would we go to them? Um, the second program was people who were somewhat stable but needed rehabilitation, and the program for them was a day program. It, w it became essentially a, a clubhouse modeled after Fountain House. And the third program was what if the people aren't stable, can't self-monitor, and won't come in? We better go to them. That was the ACT program. And then the fourth program was if people are in crisis, we need a program to help them while they're in crisis, and then they can go back to one of the other programs. So the principle that underlines this is the necessity of having in any one of our services a balance of specialization and of integration. And so one of the uh, challenges, and I'm, I'm really in admiration again of what uh, Graham's program has done, one of our challenges is that we know that mainstream um, health plans or physicians can take care of many, many people uh, who have got mental health problems, but I think game, I don't know what your reaction will be, only if they have some mental health professional there available to help them. They, so they have to have, we have to infiltrate uh, their setting and then they can be very effective with, uh, with many people. But for some people, that integrated setting isn't going to be uh, sufficient. And um, as Akil talked about before with the rehabilitation program, there's a balance. We have to have some specialized program for some people. So this principle of finding a balance between specialization and integration is an ongoing tension, and we need both. And the most that we can do in the integrated setting is what we should uh, uh, try to achieve. Well, now we'll go on with the questions uh, for the uh, panel. <laughs> Uh, about, uh, uh, I think Graham talked about the political opportunities. Uh, as you all notice, uh, we actually had luck with uh, Tamar Gozanski, a very devoted uh, MK, without whom I doubt if we had such a beautiful uh, rehabilitation law. But I want to tell another related story, which I learned in Australia last month. The uh, pr uh, premier of Victoria, Jeff Kennett, who was uh, premier, just like the governor in the U.S., uh, failed to be re-elected and then uh, got into depression. And after that, he devoted all his time to establish an uh, organization called Beyond Blue. And this organization is very powerful in Australia. It's, it's really uh, have a large impact, and it probably will convince, already convince the Australian government to do, do a very special program about depression, and perhaps also had influence on the fact that Australia appointed a federal minister for mental health. I think it's the world uh, number one, which a country which appointed a special ministry for mental health. You mean the federal another, federal government of Australia. Uh, another story which is, goes five years back is about Cyprus. Uh, the uh, a family organization in Cyprus managed to utilize the fact that Cyprus wanted to join the European Union. 
So they sent a letter to the European Union asking for an uh, inquiry commission about the situation of mental health in Cyprus as a condition for admission of Cyprus to the uh, European Union. And lo and behold, overnight, the <laughs> attitude of the Cyprus government changed. They invited the uh, families' organizations and said, what do you want, and what can we do for you, <laughs> etc. And this had a tremendous effect. So political opportunities are uh, really uh, very important and uh, to use them and for, for a really justified cause. Well, if to use your comments, I suggest that whenever we we'll make a new government in Israel and they need some more ministers or positions for ministers, we can offer them to have a minister for mental health. Also, one <laughs> another thing is maybe to uh, find out, to discover ministers who have relative with mental disability. Yeah, I know, this has already been done here. And sometimes uh, people who have, you know, politicians who have uh, personal experience with mental illness are more open to, to listen to it. Yeah. There is now one from the Brookdale Institute. I, not, I am not psychiatric. No. I have a comment and a question. The comment is that I know that to convince the Ministry of Finance, you have to demonstrate that you are reducing cost. And that is the new trend with all the services. And I, I agree that you have to have cost effectiveness um, analysis when you compare different services and what is the service that is more cost effective. But I think that we don't, the, this new trend is very uh, dangerous because not all social services are, are cost effective. We are doing, providing services because we want that the population need, even if they cost. And the dialogue that now is only on cost effectiveness, I think that is very dangerous. And you don't have to agree all the time that uh, that's one point. And the question is that the rehabilitation law that have uh, so many benefits, like many other laws, like Hoxie Louvre in the education, uh, mainstreaming in education, color the money for the most severe people, also in the education, also. And you have a large population that are not eligible to the services because they are not so severe. And they have no father and no mother. Nobody's taking care of them. I am, and I am asking how we can take care of this big population. Uh, I'm Mark uh, from the community, uh, from which community, which department? <laughs> I forgot, Haifa University anyway. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit about community resilience and your experience with uh, strengthening community resilience. And I would also like to hear more about the aspect, uh, Professor Slade, you talked about, which was cultural resilience. And I would also like you, if it is possible, to talk a bit about the, the relation you, you talked about uh, between stigma and the biological approach or the medical approach, if I understood it well. I'm not sure I understood it totally. I have a comment of what Professor Ginat said about Knesset members and their attitude concerning persons with disabilities. My name is Shirley Avrami. I'm the head of the Knesset, the Israeli Parliament Research and Information Center. And when the law was enacted on the year of 2000, I was the director of the Committee of Labor and Social Affairs of the Knesset. Um, at that time, I did PhD about Knesset members' attitude concerning the legislation of persons with, with disabilities, the Israeli ADA. And what I found, and this is concerning what Professor Ginat said, is there is no correlation between Knesset member having person with disabilities in his nuclear family and his intention to vote for this legislation. I think, first of all, this was 
the most important finding of my PhD. Is and it, secondly... Is it, is it good news or bad news? <laughs> it's very bad news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there is. Um, I think it is very bad news, and this is because when families, and this is also when Knesset members' family, doesn't matter, when families are involved, it means that the legislation will be powerful. And if the per families are not involved, it means it will not work. And we see that if Knesset members don't want to be identified as part of this family, it means there is going to be a problem with the legislation, as we see in the implementation of the Israeli ADA, the, the Israeli Person with Disabilities legislation. Thank you. And uh, concerning this, I want to ask the panel, um, what is the linkage, if there is any linkage, between all the frame of, uh, um, frame of reference of mental health and persons with disabilities in general, in practice and in legislation? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add a small <laughs> question, mainly to, uh, regarding what uh, you said, Dr. Hogan about uh, the need to start rehabilitation even before disability is uh, uh, very clear on the surface. Or, uh, but in Israel, and there is a catch in it, because you can't uh, uh, enter somebody into a rehabilitation unless they have disability first, and they're recognized for the disability. Uh, how it is? Uh, how, how do you conceive it in, in the states or in other places? And how do you deal with the issue of uh, what do we have to have first: <laughs> disability or rehabilitation? Because I, I, I totally agree, of course, that rehabilitation has to be thought of from the very first moment that you get in contact with a patient. Even from the first minute that the patient uh, became psychotic or became hospitalized for a first psychotic episode. I think that you have to think about rehabilitation from the very first moment. But then, you, he has to become recognized as a disabled before you can put him in, in a program. I'm a representative of the consumer movement in Israel. And I was really interested to ask you about peer support services. Uh, in this country, uh, it's in, in my opinion, they are very underdeveloped. We would like to hear um, your recommendations as to how to implement them further into rehabilitation services. So, so let me start a little bit with the, uh, with the last question about peer um, support services. I, I think this is something where we're, we are behind everywhere. Uh, n no place that I know our, our peer service is probably um, uh, completely adequate. Now, of course, it's always been true that more people seek self-help or talk to their neighbors or friends, which is peer support, than come to see all the therapists combined. So there is a lot of peer support out there. We just don't, we don't acknowledge it. One of my experiences with this, uh, being in the state of Ohio for 16 years, uh, Ohio had 53 local mental health systems, very strongly localized at the community level. The state provided overall guidance, but these communities were all different. And I began to observe a, a, a pattern that the communities with the best overall mental health services had a strong program that was owned and run and staffed by people in recovery. Uh, we started calling this a recovery center. We might say a, a, a peer center. And um, the, this was never the biggest program. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, on, in the communities that had the highest investment in a recovery center, it was about 5% of the overall budget. That was the, that was the highest level. But it seemed that somewhere an investment of, let's say, three or four percent of the overall budget was needed to establish enough of a recovery center or a peer support capacity. Then the question was, why is this true and how does this, um, how does this work? Uh, and I had a 
an interesting experience in talking with the director of one of these uh, recovery centers um, uh, after it had been in operation for, for many years, who told me that in the year before, and I checked these statistics, more people had come into the mental health system through this consumer-owned recovery center than through the mental health center in town. And it was a very good, it was a very good clinic. And it had three locations and good relationships with university training programs and competent clinicians, and they did very well in their inspections and so on. But more people came in to the recovery center. And they said that this was because people felt that you could get practical help there, and people did not feel threatened that their children might be taken away. And in many cases, people would go from the recovery center and go and get professional treatment. Um, also, in some cases, uh, they would just stop with the support that they got, they got there. So my way of thinking is that uh, a community cannot have a well-functioning, a best, a best-functioning mental health center without a consumer-run program as a part of it. That, that's all. I don't know how big, I don't know how we do that, but I, I, I believe that we can't be the best that we can be unless we have a program like that as a, um, as a part of what we're doing. And I guess, let me comment on one other uh, question that comes up in, in several ways. We, so we focus here on uh, rehabilitation. We focus on people who already have a substantial disability. And there are several questions about uh, what else should be done um, about, uh, about uh, resilience and uh, so on. And I'll just make uh, two uh, comments about, about those priorities. One is that I really uh, appreciate uh, what uh, Graham has said about the emphasis on depression and anxiety, and I would say for children on ADHD, and how so many mild and moderate depression and mild and moderate anxiety are very disabling, considering they affect so many people, even if it's not a lifelong major disability. But it, it causes great grief and pain. It goes back to the point about, uh, about happiness. And in many cases, pediatricians or family medicine doctors or other general practitioners can do a very good job helping people with the ADHD or depression or anxiety if they just get a little support in that, uh, in that work. And finally, my comment would be, aside from that, I, I think, from my experience, the best place to start in terms of community resiliency is with children. And if we could do just two things, um, I believe, and one is to provide support to pediatricians. And the second is, I, I, don't, I don't know why, I think it's scandalous, that certainly in the United States, we don't have opportunities to help every parent who would like some help with how to be a good parent. And we know that the techniques to help parents who are interested in that support to be a good parent are very effective uh, build stronger children and avoid many problems later on down the road. Um, thanks. I, I'd like to um, again briefly address a, f a few of the points. So for the first, um, just to clarify the strand about stigma, it's to challenge the assumption that would initially seem very plausible that if mental illness is understood by the population as an illness like any other illness, then stigma will certainly reduce and probably disappear. The research evidence is not consistent with that view. Um, the, the second strand about cultural resilience, I, I guess for me, I, I don't feel I have great expertise other than a recognition that if we are going to be about supporting recovery, in the mental health system, then that needs to start with a really sophisticated understanding of identity and personhood rather than illness. I mean, I, I reflect on my clinical training, which was all about illness. So very pragmatically, it means, for example, my training taught me quite a lot about risk factors for mental illness. It didn't teach me very much about protective factors. And we know, for example, in um, children, adolescents, one of the protective factors is, pro -social, is um, good bonds with pro-social peers. So it's a testable research question whether the money we currently spend on preventative strategies targeting individuals 
if instead we did things like build skateboard parks, where adolescents can be together and hang out together in a re relatively safe and contained environment, might actually have a higher health gain. So it starts to open up new questions when we start thinking at the community and cultural level. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more tomorrow about identity and sort of different academic disciplines that inform that. The, the um, third strand is, is the how, how does rehabilitation link with people with disabilities? I, I guess I find it useful to have a conceptual understanding that there are different broad models of understanding we can use to make sense of what I would label as, as mental illness. There are clinical models, and every professional worker in the room will have expertise, no doubt, in, in understanding through their own lens those experiences. There are then social models of disability where we see not a person with an illness, but rather a person in their environment. And the challenge becomes improving the integration between the person and the environment. And that may involve action in the environment in terms of making adaptations, or in the person in terms of providing rehabilitation and treatments. But there's a third broad class of model, diversity models. And I think we, over time, these will become more visible. This is, this is the basic rejection of the idea of illness. And these are very difficult conversations to have, I find, as a clinician who's imbued with the view that these experiences are necessarily understood as mental illness. There are emerging research and practice approaches internationally. Hearing Voices Network would be one good example that explicitly reject the idea that this is, these experiences are illness experiences. So there are broad debates about the basic way we see things. And just to finish the, the fantastic point the lady in the, in the middle made about um, the dangers of focusing on value, on cost effectiveness, I absolutely agree. I previously said about if we're going to spend money, we should ensure we have value for money and proposed a, an approach for what value might mean in this context. But my own view is that recovery is at its heart a social justice issue. It's about exactly the same thing as women's rights, about um, other forms of identity politics. And we shouldn't lose sight of that in our efforts to make arguments that are persuasive to particular stakeholders like finance ministries. It's getting harder to follow each of these. <laughs> I want to pick up the, the point about discrimination that you made. Um, about five years ago, I felt um, increasingly uncomfortable in what I was doing as a psychiatrist. And I tried to formulate that vague feeling as about uh, stigma, uh, including stigma against mental health professionals. So I got a sabbatical to go off and write a book about stigma and read lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of papers. And I then became frustrated because of the um, vagueness of the concept. And I became angry because the stigma concept hasn't really helped us to do anything about it. So, um, in fact, the book I wrote was not about stigma. The book was about discrimination. And I, I didn't abandon the stigma word because it's actually, as we've seen here today, it's, it's very widely used, it's very widely understood. Um, so what I suggest is that stigma is actually an overarching umbrella term containing three elements. There's a problem of knowledge, which is a mixture of ignorance, uh, but also misinformation among our populations. A problem of emotions or affect of feelings, which is uh, prejudice, which is uh, hardly researched at all actually, but almost entirely negative. And a problem of behavior, namely discrimination. And I think that it's the action, it's the behavior, it's the discrimination which is the most important domain. And so on the basis of that, um, the focus of our research in this area has actually shifted onto the behavioral domain. And we explicitly measure knowledge and attitudes and behavior when we do stigma-related studies. And we st started just two years ago now, a big national campaign against discrimination in England. It's called Time to Change. It's based explicitly upon the idea that it's direct social contact with somebody with a mental health condition, which is the active ingredient. And again and again in the research, that's the most strong predictor of favorable attitudes. And then there's a question about um, the trigger to that being disclosure by increasing numbers of people so that others know that that person has a mental illness, inducing more favorable attitudes and behavior in the and those people around them. And that this brings us on to discrimination, because once you then have uh, genericization 
of people with disabilities to include people with mental and physical health related disabilities, then in many countries like yours, like mine, you already have laws in place which can be activated. It's not as simple as that because quite often, well, in my case, in England, the disability sector for a long time has been most reluctant to include people with mental illness into its midst. The sector was essentially composed of people, you know, the icon of somebody in the wheelchair or a physical disability or multiple sclerosis or whatever. And that, that in itself was, I think, a form of stigmatization. They actually didn't want the mental to be in their mainstream because of the, the effects of um, adverse opinions. And gradually now, the mental health sector is going from a stigma view into a discrimination view and wanting to get into the mainstream of discrimination policy because that's where there are laws, that's where there are entitlements. But the, the, one of the twists is that the entitlements depend upon disclosure of having the condition before you can get the entitlements or the reasonable adjustments, or reasonable accommodations. And at the moment, quite often people are reluctant to disclose for all the reasons we would know about and therefore rule themselves out of gaining the benefits of going down a disability route. So let me make a couple of comments about meta issues that I think uh, cut across many of the questions that have come up. One is that uh, uh, one of the great things about uh, psychiatric rehabilitation, which I've always uh, liked tremendously, is that uh, it wants to get um, those of us who are clinicians and practitioners as well as clients and families and communities to focus on strengths rather than weaknesses. You know, there's much about our healthcare system and our mental health care that keeps, uh, keeps us focused on, uh, you know, diseases and deficits and what people can't do and uh, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, we all know from raising our own kids that, you know, that's not the way to focus to help kids uh, grow up and uh, get better at what they can do. You're, you're much, much better off if your kid can't add, as I had one, one uh, kid who went through remedial math about six years in a row, and uh, you know, finally a good uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, counselor said to me, well, you know, but she loves to read and write and, and do art, so just, uh, just focus on that, forget about math, you know? There are other jobs in life. And uh, you know, now she works for a publisher and reviews art books and you know, just works out wonderfully. And she still can't add, uh, you know, but she's got a good job and feels very good about herself. Well, I think that kind of learning is what uh, rehabilitation is, is all about. You know, I, I had a patient uh, years ago in Boston who was uh, cutting herself up every day and was in and out of the hospital because she couldn't stop cutting and was in psychotherapy for hundreds of years and had all the uh, medications. And uh, what helped this lady finally was uh, a uh, rehab specialist who said to her, well, you know, that's an amazing skill you have with the delicate uh, cutting. Uh, I think we could get you a job in an animal lab. And uh, they got this lady a job at, at the uh, MIT uh, biology lab. And she would go in at night uh, which was great for her because she couldn't get along with people. So there was nobody there at night. She would go in and she would spend all night long uh, going around and finding the animals that had died during the day. And then her job was to cut them up and, you know, uh, dissect out all the organs and weigh them and lay them out. And, uh, uh, and she loved this job. Uh, and kept it for years, earned a lot of money, got off disability. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, got out of psychotherapy, wasn't high, stopped cutting herself, you know. It was an unbelievable uh, intervention that I ne would never have occurred to me. Um, and, you know, that's how good rehab therapists think about the world, you know. I, I saw a lady uh, just a few weeks ago who, she was in her 50s, and uh, she had never worked in her life uh, in a legitimate job. You know, she had been a heroin addict and a prostitute from childhood. And at age 50, she stopped using heroin and uh, uh, she didn't want 
more mental health treatment. You know, she wanted a job and to be able to take care of herself. And some smart rehab therapist realized that this woman had a tremendous skill for finding veins, and they got her a job in all of the DC hospitals as a blood drawer. So she goes around and draws blood on all the patients that the regular blood draw team, uh, you know, can't find. Um, and those are the kind of stories that you hear every day when you, uh, you know, follow really good uh, rehabilitation therapists. And it's because, you know, they're focused on not what this person can't do, uh, you know, but what they can do. Um, and I think for all of us, whether we're doctors or psychotherapists or rehab uh, specialists, that's a really, really fundamental uh, lesson. Let me just make one other meta comment. Uh, uh, you know, the, our experience in the United States has been just like uh, what others have mentioned, which is that um, people with uh, the, all of our disability laws and disability regulations were developed after World War II for uh, veterans who came home from the war and were badly, uh, you know, injured from war uh, experience and. Uh, you know, we're in wheelchairs and we're permanently disabled and we're never going to be able uh, to work. And the disability system has um, very reluctantly and slowly agreed to give any disability uh, payments to people who have uh, serious mental disorders. And in order to get those, to get on those uh, disability payments, they essentially have to spend two or three years convincing, uh, you know, a board that they're completely and totally disabled, they can't do a thing for themselves in life, they'll never be able to work again, and, you know, several doctors have to sign a letter verifying that this person will never be able to work a day in his life. And of course, we know none of that is true, you know? Almost everybody with psychiatric illness is, is, can work and is going to get uh, better over time. But, but the psychological process of, of uh, you know, is so disabling uh, in itself that uh, just has a horrible, horrible effect on people. So, um, you know, I one of the things that we're working very, very hard on is with our Social Security Administration to try to, um, you know, redo the criteria and redo the disability laws and regulations and everything so that it's a more humane process and so that it emphasizes from the beginning, uh, you know, Yes, you're partially disabled and, you know, you need some help right now, but we also uh, believe you can work and get back to uh, social roles that are meaningful for you, and we're going to help you with that uh, from day one, as, as Dr. Hogan uh, pointed out. I have one last thought. I don't know if we're drawing to a close, but the uh, we, we've commented on the extraordinary success in achieving some of these uh, changes in Australia and talked a lot about the different uh, strategies that might be used to uh, find a member of parliament who has a problem or whatever. And I, it also occurred to me that Australia now has a citizen of the year who's a psychiatrist. So these things come together. And so I, I think our number one strategy probably for political success, and I, I say this with a conflict of interest because my mother was Australian, but is it we should go to Australia. Thank you. Any more important questions? <laughs> the one, one last thing I would like to ask the, you is, is maybe the participation or, or inclusion of a consumer within a, a professional team. Does anybody have experience with that? The inclusion of a consumer within a, a professional team. Um, now, I work at a, uh, a level that is pretty far removed from anything, but all of my experiences are that it's a very good thing, that it, uh, it, it gives uh, other consumers somebody to relate to, re to, relate to. it uh, humanizes um, the, the situation. I, I almost think of an interdisciplinary team as uh, needing to have a consumer as a discipline. So we have a a physician, a social worker, an occupational person, a nurse. We should have a, a person with the lived experience 
if, if one of the other professionals, if nobody else is qualified through lived experience, let's find somebody whose qualification uh, uh, is that. Uh, it you adds mean, great you mean value. consumer is not a profession? Um, <laughs> no, but it's a very significant experience that it's yeah. very hard to completely understand unless you've, uh, unless you've had it yourself. Uh, um, I've, I've had the privilege of seeing services around the world that employ people with lived experience in the service as, as workers. And it, it seems to me there are four stages that services go through. Um, the first is no involvement, where the, the unchallenged view is it is the job of experts to treat the patient. The second is token or nominal involvement, where there is a recognition it's probably not okay just to tell people what to do. So there is some level of not very powerful involvement. So for example, uh, the, the patient, and they will still be known as patients, may sign the plan that has been decided by the professional, or they may be, um, their views are recorded, and then the best treatment is given in the basis of expert judgment. Then there is real involvement, which is characterized by a recognition of the limitations of professional knowledge, that it both has high value and has limitations in what it can understand and has built-in biases. And over time, some services transform to working in partnership, where there is a genuine sense that it is not possible to do the job without involvement of lived experience in the job. And that is the kind of context when peer support workers can make an amazing contribution. For example, being the first person that someone new to the service meets as a role model for recovery, there is nothing more powerful than meeting someone who has been there and moved on in, in their life. And such services, when they have reached the point of partnership, also start questioning other things, such as who they give voice to in settings like this. I'll give you a brief example. It's happening to me now in terms of my research um, team. Uh, I'm finalizing a proposal related to what I call implementation science. This is about uh, why practitioners don't implement guidelines when they receive clinical guidelines. And, <clears throat> and uh, there's two, there's a leading service user and a leading carer as part of this team. And uh, in the bid, it, there's a section saying, describe the public and patient involvement. And I put, oh, we've got consultation, we've got active involvement, we've got user-led elements. And these people wrote back to me yesterday and the day before saying, no, we don't, we're not involved that much. This is, you know, you're exaggerating it. We want to lead a part of it, one, one module of this. Um, so I was, I had to reflect, uh, and they were right, because no, no single part was led by, any con by consumers. So we've changed it, so uh, an important section of this, uh, this program is led by the consumers. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was challenged by them, and they were right, and I sort of recoiled a bit. Um, but it's easy as a professional to sort of drift towards tokenism unless you're continuously prompted to do the right thing. I concur with whatever everybody said. You know, we, we have about 10% uh, people with uh, um, psychiatric disability on our research team, and they're uh, huge contributors. And uh, in fact, are our main clinical trainers, too. I don't know if you've heard of Pat Deegan and uh, Lindy Fox, but, uh, you know, Pat acknowledges a lifetime of schizophrenia and Lindy a lifetime of bipolar illness. And uh, they're fabulous, fabulous trainers that every uh, clinician, uh, uh, regardless of their background, uh, listens to and uh, appreciates. Well, thank you. I think that with this, we'll conclude uh, this session. Thank you.